the place of mercy in the journey of life. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Solomon speaking. I mean, Solomon, you know Solomon. Solomon speaking. I returned under the sun, meaning that I have gone length and breadth. I have searched all over. This is my conclusion. I returned under the sun and I found out that the race is not good the swift. The battle of life is not good the strong. No bread for the wise. No riches to men for understanding. No favor to men of skin. But our father, that time and chance happens to them all. End of story. In life, in my little life, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I will turn 54 next month. I have come to understand that in life, energy and strength, good as they are, does not connote success. I have found out in life, the skill, knowledge, education, qualification, beauty, handsomeness, eloquence, ability, good as the world, just a guarantee success. I've said that. He said, time and chance happen to them all. You know what that means? For time and chance to happen, it takes mercy. For you to be at the right place at the right time, it takes mercy of God. Mercy. Second Samuel, rather, chapter 1, verse 23, talking about Jonathan and Saul. First Samuel, chapter 1, verse 23, talking about King Saul and Jonathan. You know what he said? He said, Saul and Jonathan, in their lives, they were pleasant people. They were great people. They were lovely. They were pleasant. Look at the adjective between they were qualified. <laughs> Swifter than eagles. Stronger than lions. Yet they died. One day, they won battle. Swifter than eagles. Eagles are very swift, high speed. They were swifter than eagle. They were stronger than lions. Yet, both father and son died one day. With all their swiftness, with all their strength, they still died in battle. It takes more than strength to win a war. Look at that sister. I have all my strategies planned. But thank God they failed. When Samuel got to the house of Jesse and he wanted to anoint a king in the house of Jesse, the moment 
Samuel saw Elia, the first one, he said, surely, here comes the anointed of God. You know the meaning of surely? No doubt, this is the choosing of the Lord. Looking at his countenance, his height, his dominion, his everything put together. And Samuel was a first class prophet. He said, yeah! This is the one. When he looked at everything put together, he said, this must be the king. But lo and behold, God said, no, not at all. Okay? Abinadab, the second son came. He also looked like him. But God said, no. The third one, Shama, came. God said, no. Who else could he be? If not among all of these. Now, can you check for me? I think first Samuel chapter 16, verse 6. Verse 6. I'm telling you, God's people, it takes more than skill. It takes more than your education or your qualification. To get the things done. The place of mercy in the journey of life. Are you there? And it came to pass when they were come. No, God, the, the verse before there. And he said, Peaceably, I, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. I mean, when you see a prophet coming to your house in those days, uh, said that you are in trouble. So when this is saw somewhere coming in without notice, he said, are, you, are, are we at peace? Why are you here? Peace play, I have come. Somewhere replied, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And so, Jesus sanctified or sanctified and his sons and he called them to the sacrifice. Now, if you are a Bible student, we know how many sons were sanctified. At this point in time, only seven. Jesus sanctified himself. Abinadab and the, and the rest, they also sanctified themselves. So, Jesse plus seven, they were the people that were sanctified because they wanted to appoint a king in the midst of them. And interestingly, those that were sanctified were not the called. Because as they were sanctified here, and they, they paroled themselves before somewhere, even though they were sanctified, yet they were not the choice. Interestingly, when the choice of God came, there was no time to sanctify him. Because then somebody said, we shall not sit down until he comment. These guys here, they follow protocol. They order. Because you can't appear before God without being sanctified. But when it was time for David to show, there was no need for sanctification. He said, break it, break it, break We shall not see that until he comes. It's not a time to are sanctified before Jesus. No, no, no. It takes mercy to break protocol. The protocol was broken. The order was lifted. There was no time. David just ran out of the booth only to come onto the throne. I speak over your life this week. Every order, every protocol that is hindering your destiny, it shall be lifted. Amen. Come on. Order is good. Protocol is good. It's good. But there are situations where you have to break protocols. David didn't have to go through sanctification. That is why God is not calling the sanctified. He's calling the unqualified so that he can qualify them. When David showed up, all his power, and he was recounting that later, he said, The Lord anointed my head in the midst of my enemy, and my cup run it over. Surely goodness and mercy. What is he saying there? I got what I got by mercy. 
for thy strength shall no man prevail. For the Lord will keep the feet of his saint, but the wicked will be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. That sister told us how strategies, how he has put things in place. It takes God to deliver it. Can I hear someone say amen? amen. In Psalm 102, verse 13, Thou shalt arise upon Zion with mercy. Can you check it for me? Psalm 102, verse 13, I guess. Thou shalt arise. And what will you do? Mercy. Talk to me, what will you do? Mercy. And you will have mercy upon who? Do you see that? Double color. I'm always looking for double color. You know what that means? I'm going to expatiate further what I'm talking about. Thou shalt arise and you will have mercy upon Zion. What is the resultant effect? Therefore, the time to favor her. Yay! The same time as you know what that means? Mercy precedes favor. We can't talk of favor without talking of mercy. That is why it's first of all saying, Mercy will come upon you and thou shall receive favor. Let us come therefore boldly unto the throne of grace that first of all we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. It is mercy that creates grace. It is mercy that precedes favor. Hallelujah. For the mercy of God, in spite of all that you have had, swifter than eagle, stronger than lion. The race is not to the swift. What that means is that the fastest does not always win the race. The stronger does not always win the battle. You know that. The wise men are still poor. But time and chance happens to them all. Now, hear, you, hear me well. All those things, the skill, wisdom, swiftness, strength, they are necessary, but they are not sufficient to get the thing done. I speak into your life this year that the year of sevenfold return shall be delivered to you Amen. on the platform of mercy. Amen. It's our year of sevenfold, and we're in the second half of the year. It will take mercy to deliver it. Amen. May you collect, may it be delivered to you Amen. on the platform of mercy. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So, those things are necessary. I'm not underplaying preparation. I'm not under, I'm not, I'm not trying to underemphasize that you must have skill. I'm a great proponent that you must educate yourself, increase, increase, get all the collective, collect them. But make sure mercy is the crown of it all. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Bring out your, bring out your phone. Bring out your phone. If you have one, bring it, your iPhone. Bring it out. I'm, I'm, I will show you something here. There was a time. Go to your calculator. Go to your calculator. If you don't bring your, stay by someone who has who has his phone. Go to your calculator. We want to do a little math here. <clears throat> you remember Gideon? The Lord wanted to deliver the Midianite into his hand. And there were 32,000 soldiers ready to go to battle, to go and fight the Amalekite or the Midianite. How many? 32,000. And there are hefty men ready for battle. In Judges chapter 7. Now, when God saw the multitude, God said, hey, these people are too many 
for me to deliver this job. So there are those people who are afraid. There are people who are fearful to go back. You know how many people went back? 22,000 out of 32. So they were left with 10,000 people. And God still look at the number. So, this number is still, is still too much. Anyone who can lap the water with his head bowed and can lap water like a dog, those are the people that will go to battle. That is a tough thing to do. He said, 10,000 people, that 22 has gone. He said, only people who can lap water like a dog will go to this battle. And out of 10,000, only 300. From 32,000 to 300. Now, if your phone is with you, let's do the mathematics. Here. Let's find out the percentage of people that God needed. And God wanted to teach you a mini lesson. And of course, Gideon, that for by strength, I don't say by multitude, for by strength shall no one prevail. That was the key lesson there. Now, can you divide, put 300 over 32,000? Multiply by 100 over 1. You still remember our mathematics now? So that you get the percentage of the people that is needed out of 32,000. And what's your answer? 0.1. So it's not up, up, not even, okay, let's, uh, let's be generous. Approximately 1%. But in actuality, it's only 0 0.093 or 0 0.094%. Or less than one percent. What that means to me, when God is asking you to do anything, He's only asking for one percent. Ninety-nine percent belongs to Him, and into the hand of three hundred people, the Lord delivered the Midianites into the hands of Gideon. Whatever commitment God is asking from you, is only one percent. The 99% is gone behind the scene. And that is a God factor. And one of the God factors I'm bringing your way today is the place of mercy. In the journey of life. Can I hear you say amen? Amen. Number two. The act of the testimony. The act of the testimony. Exodus, let's go there, Exodus chapter 25, Exodus 25, from verse 17, look up, and thou shalt make a mercy seed of pure gold, now God speaking to Moses here, to commit, please mark the details, God is a detail God, to commit and a half, shall be the length thereof and the cubit and half the breadth thereof. In other words, God was giving the specification for the box. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beating work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. Go ahead. And make one cherub on one end and the other cherub, that's an angel, on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. God is a detail God. Next verse. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat, and with their wings and with their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat. Shall the faces of the cherubims be? 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat, mark it, thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark, thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. What is specificity of God? You will mark it, you will put the testimony. The testimony, I will give you a testimony. And that testimony will be under the cover of the mercy seat. 
the next verse I shall give you a testimony 22 now and there I will meet with you let me stop there look at that scripture in verse 21 I will give you a testimony that testimony must be under what? the mercy seat now look at that specification God Almighty is so specific about the length of the box the length, the breadth of it why is God so specific? oh, I think you remember when God was creating what God was giving instruction to Noah about the ark you need to go there, it looks boring but you know what God is saying? I am a detailed God when he wanted to build the tabernacle, he also gave details to tell you God is a detailed God. The point here is this. If God can be so detailed about boxes, God is more detailed about your life. You are more worth than a box. Because some of us think, hey, God, he, he doesn't care about me. He cares. And I want to make that bold and clear. That even the hairs of your head are numbered. You go to Bible Salon and they scrape it. Go count them. To make sure that every strand of your hair is counted. That is how precious, how detailed God can be. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, message. You know that scripture? I want to go there. Hmm. Wave your hands to the Lord. For big detail over your life. Everything you are passing through, God has the detail. Look at that scripture. If God gives such attention to the appearance of white flowers that today they are grown up, tomorrow they wither up, God gives attention to white flower that even most of which never even see. You don't even see them. But yet, God gives attention to them. Don't you think He will attend to you? He will take pride in you? He will do His best for you? Let's verse. What I'm trying to do here, God speaking, is to get you to relax. Come on. Do not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. Next verse. People who don't know God and the way God works, they fools, they are worried, they are anxious over these things. But you know both God and how God works. Next verse. Come on now. Steep your life in God reality, in God initiative. I love this scripture. In God provision, steep your life. Don't worry about missing out. You will find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Verse 34, closing. Give your attention, therefore, to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked on about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard time or hard things that come when that time comes. This is God's blueprint for your life. The scripture is the picture of your future. The scripture is the picture of your future. This is what God is saying. Now, back to that Exodus. I will give you the testimony. I put the testimony under the ark. You know what God is saying? Your life is a testimony. Your mandate, your divine mandate must be within the box. You know why? It doesn't want the testimony to get lost. So it must be in the box. Oh, your vision must be in the box. And when all of that is done, 
put it under the mercy seat. It takes mercy to deliver the testimony into your hand. Is somebody with me here? It takes God to deliver that vision. That sister, I keep saying, he said, I put all the strategies together. It takes mercy of God to deliver, to make the strategy work for you. The horse is made ready for the day of battle. But safety is of the Lord. Safety is of the Lord. Some trust the horses, some a chariot. I will remember the name of the Lord my God. They are brought down and fallen. We stand, we stand upright. Ephraim, it was armed. We were told in Psalm 78, at verse 9, we were told that Ephraim was armed with bows and arrows. But the day of battle, he turned back. He couldn't stand it. You know why? Listen. The children of Israel being armed. And they were carrying bows and arrows. But yet, when the battle began, they turned back. It takes God to make all the things you have planned come true. That's why he said, Oh Lord, let your mercy be upon us. According to all that we hope for. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen? Hear ye the word of the Lord Church. There's a difference between testimony and testimonial. There is a difference between testimony and testimonial. Second Timothy chapter 4. Paul speaking. Verse 6. I am being poured out like a drink. The time of my departure is now. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. That is the testimony. Testimonial begins from the next verse. He said, therefore now, that is laid off for me, the crown of righteousness. That is the, that, that, that's the testimonial. The one I first read is the testimony, sir. The testimonial of the testimony. He said, therefore now, there is laid off for me, what? The crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give, not only to me, but also to them. And love is appearing. That is the testimonial. May your testimony translate to a testimonial. Testimonial is the trophy. After the testimony, you get the trophy. From your trial, you get your triumph. From the triumph is the trophy. From your test is your testimony. From your testimony is your testimonial. Until you get the testimonial, you have not finished. Are you with me, sir? Oh, Solomon. Solomon. Solomon got the testimony. He didn't get the testimony. Testimonial is their work. They shake your hand, they give them. When we were in primary school, they gave us testimonial. They call it in those days. I don't know what to call it now. But in those days in our age, they call it testimonial. Take your testimonial. Testimonial is that you are finished, you are finished your course. Then, there are many testimony that does not translate to testimonial. Until they give you your trophy, you have not finished. Somebody with me here? Not only the testimony. Something called the testimony. He didn't have the testimony. We know people in our days, in our contemporary world, who have testimony, but they don't have the testimony. Or you say, I will give you a testimony, but let that testimony be under the mercy seat so that it can deliver. Hallelujah, I say hallelujah. Amen. Let me close with this. I'm going to judge you here. I will judge you. Hebrews chapter 5. Let me close there because of time. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. And then we pray. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 4. Hebrews 5, verse 4 to 6. Now, do you know that Jesus, he needed mercy? Really? Yes, sir. Jesus needed mercy in the flesh. 
And no man take this honor unto himself. But he that is called of God, as Aaron was called. Next verse. So also Christ purified not himself to be made an high priest. But he that said unto him, You are thou at my son. This day have I begotten thee. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look up. Look up. Read the next verse. It helps us. Read the next verse. Who in the days of his flesh, when he was a human being here, when he had offered prayers and what? Supplication. And what? Supplication. You know the meaning of supplication? Endless asking with begging. Yes, is the Son of God. Yes, is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Yes, he said, Thou art my son, my only begotten son. You are called into the office of the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. All he said, it won't, You won't become it until you pray. Therefore, he prayed, not just praying, he supplicated, supplicated is asking, it's an action of you asking for something with me. Begging, earnestly, humbly, it takes mercy. How many prayer warriors are? Jesus prayed to get it through. The Bible says, if you read for that, it, it said, it said, and for Jesus to become the high priest, this is the secret. In the days of his life, he had to pray as obligate. Now, if Jesus had to do that, although he was the Son of God, how much more? I want to leave you here today and seek for nothing but the mercy of God. Next week, I will lead you to how to obtain mercy. How do I obtain it? That's our focus next week. Rest of your feet. Why do we come up here? Let's sing this song. I have nothing else. Stand upon the, the solid rock. On Christ I stand. You can't stand on your qualification. You can't stand on your skill. You can't stand on all of those. It doesn't make sense as it were. If they are void of mercy. Please, you bring up that song. It's a, it's a song. It's called um, um, uh, I, I Have Nothing Else. On Christ, that solid rock I stand. All other ground is a second sign. The point I'm leading you to this morning is for you to know that in spite of all you may have had, you need to stand upon the mercy of God. My hope is built on nothing else. I, think, I hope you know that song. My hope is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' Why are you with me here? And I want you to sing it.